Disclaimer. J.K. Rowling can read your mind. Or is that what she wants you to think? Is there something you'd like to share with the class, Miss Granger? Umbridge asked. Hermione's eyebrows rose. She hadn't even said anything. No, Professor, she answered. Come now, surely a student as brilliant as you must have something to say on this subject. Okay, this was a bad sign. Maybe she should have been a bit more careful about flaunting her victory. I think we've already exhausted the discussion about my position on the course book, ma'am, Hermione said evenly. Oh, really? Umbridge said with a grin. And you seemed so talkative before. I almost would have thought you meant to teach the class yourself. She knows, Hermione thought. She must not have proof or she'd have acted already, but she knows. I have a tendency to be very opinionated, Professor, but honestly, defense isn't really my top subject. No, of course not. That would be arithmancy and transfiguration, allegedly. Hermione bristled. I think my published research speaks for itself. Research undertaken with far more distinguished academics, Miss Granger? She gave one of her false giggles. I think we've already been over that subject as well. Some of those were sole author papers. So you say, whether you were truly responsible for that research is between you and your collaborators, isn't it? Professor Vector will vouch for my integrity, Hermione snapped. And she and Rebecca Gamp will confirm the importance of my contribution to our recent joint project. If you want to question my work, you'll have to... That's enough, Umbridge snapped. Five points from Gryffindor for your excessive interruptions, Miss Granger. Hermione suppressed an eye roll. Umbridge was the one who had interrupted in the first place. The rest of the class proceeded without incident. Despite Hermione's umbrage troubles, though, with her victory in getting the Quidditch team reinstated, she finally had time to work on her other pressing issue, which was, what on earth was going on with Harry's occlumency lessons? Harry consistently became agitated when he was reminded of his lessons with Professor Snape. Maybe it was just Snape, but that didn't seem like a good sign either. Hermione still didn't really understand it, and Harry never wanted to talk about it, so it was time to try the library. She had already looked a little over the past week, looking into visions, dreams, mind healing, meditation, and anything else she could think of that was mental, and what she'd found told her that any detailed material would be in the restricted section. So she ran up to Septima's office before dinner to get a pass to browse the restricted section. That wasn't hard at this point, since Septima trusted her to be responsible with powerful magic. Hermione just gave her a few vague reasons why she wanted in there that were related to her arithmancy research, and none of which were really false, and Septima wrote her a blank check. Fortunately, Umbridge didn't have the power to veto that. Yet. Okay, it wasn't a completely blank check. Septima would be sent a list of any books Hermione actually checked out, and she, and probably Umbridge, could veto them individually, but it was good enough. Unfortunately, it was hard to find anything even in the restricted section. Hermione spent a lot of her free time on Monday evening, and again on Tuesday and Wednesday, poking around and finding mostly references and a few details. Occlumency was, unhelpfully, defined as the defense against something called legilimency. Legilimency was even harder to find than occlumency, and was usually described as an invasion or attack on the mind. It didn't seem to be the same as the Imperious Curse, the Confundus Charm, or various other mind-altering charms, seeing as it was sometimes listed alongside them in a list of mind magics. Occlumency was supposed to offer some degree of protection against all of those things, but most especially against legilimency. Harry's visions did seem to qualify it as an attack on his mind, so at least that fit. While it wasn't clear what occlumency was supposed to protect against, there were descriptions of occlumency floating around. But surprisingly, it was mostly described in terms of esoteric mental exercises and meditative techniques to the point where she wasn't sure it was actual magic at all. Harry never seemed very calm or meditative when he returned from his lessons with Snape, 
But then, having to study it with Snape probably wasn't conducive to a calm and meditative state of mind. Either way, Harry seemed even crankier than usual, which, again, was not a good sign. She tried to question him about it, but he still didn't want to talk about it, and he snapped at everyone who asked. It didn't seem like it was doing him much good, but all she could do was keep researching and hope she found something useful. Hermione's life went on. In defense class on Wednesday, Umbridge decided to single her out again. What was it about this week? Miss Granger, what would you say is the optimal way of defending oneself against a basilisk? Okay, this was getting weird, she thought. Hermione's and her friend's adventure at the end of second year hadn't got a lot of play, but it had been in the curse-breaking circulars, so Umbridge might know about it. But even so, what was she doing bringing it up? Unsure of what to do, Hermione decided to give the correct answer rather than the correct answer. Like all Class 5 creatures, Wilbert Slinkhod's recommended response to a basilisk is apparating away very fast. A few people giggled, but Umbridge didn't. That is indeed what the book says, but you did not answer my question. What do you think the optimal method is? What on earth was she playing at? Actually, ma'am, I think I have to agree with Mr. Slinkhod on this one. A few quills clattered in surprise. Harry and Ron snapped out of their bored, half-asleep trance to stare at her. Umbridge grinned. How interesting, she said. But didn't you write a paper on that very subject, Miss Granger? Are you doubting your own research? Oh, that's what she was playing at. Hermione hesitated. She had to choose her words carefully to save face and not undermine her own point. Not at all, ma'am. But that was a highly unusual situation in which safer avenues of action were closed to us. I have never disputed that discretion is sometimes the better part of valor, and facing a Class 5X creature is a prime example of a situation in which it is better to get away and call in the professionals, if possible. Where I think Mr. Slinkhard errs is ignoring the fact that there are sometimes situations where... So you stand by your assertion that you found a better way of subduing a basilisk at age 12? 13, ma'am and I never said it was better. I said that, excuse me, I don't remember my exact wording, but I believe I said it would be a life-saving safety measure and would be a useful addition to other methods. I have corresponded with curse-breakers in India who used my method in the field, and... Umbridge cut her off again before she could make an advantageous point. She really wasn't giving any ground today. So we have a rather ill-advised method of dealing with magical creatures, a trivial potions insight that anyone could have made if they'd been troubled to bother, and a few useless toy spells making up your alleged sole author papers, Miss Granger. Merlin's beard. Umbridge had read her entire curriculum vitae to try to discredit her work. Hermione wasn't sure whether to be proud or sick. I'm not sure I understand what this has to do with defense, Professor, she said nervously. I'm merely endeavoring to give your classmates a balanced assessment of your academic abilities. Since you seem to think you know so much more than the students and staff at this school. Hermione saw red. She knew Umbridge was trying to undermine her academics, but this was her entire career she was playing with. Finally deciding enough was enough, she snapped. Griselda Marchbanks said I had the best arithmancy newt she'd ever seen, as a fourth year. You can ask her yourself if you don't believe me. Umbridge didn't miss a beat. Griselda Marchbanks is 130 years old, and her competence as head of the Wizarding Examinations Authority is already under review for other reasons. By which they both knew she meant Marchbanks' opposition to the Ministry's interference at Hogwarts. You may have been good enough to pass the exam, but you should take what she says personally with a large pinch of salt. The staff at Transfiguration today, and Annals of Arithmancy, think my work is deserving of the Gamp and Wenlock prizes, Hermione said, at least enough to nominate me. Umbridge's smile returned. Even the best scholars can be fooled from time to time, Miss Granger. Hermione decided to talk to Harry about his occlumency lessons after he got back that night. She'd let it go so far, but she decided she really needed some straight answers. 
And, truth be told, after her encounter with Umbridge, she wasn't in a mood to take no for an answer. They were still waiting on Harry to get back, though, when Fred and George burst into the common room with big grins on their faces. When George spotted her, he lifted her out of her seat and kissed her. Jackpot, Hermione! he yelled. Uh, what's this now? she said. The other puffskin we were trying to breed with Cyrano had her kits. Oh, that's nice. I take it from your reaction you got some more dwarfs out of it? We think so. It's kind of hard to tell when they're babies. But that's not the best part. You know how the mother was a fancy red? Yeah? Well, the babies all came out pink and purple. Hermione stared at him blankly. She was happy for her boyfriend, but she had no frame of reference for why he was so happy. So that's good then? she asked. Good? Good? It's unheard of, Fred jumped in. See, there hasn't been that much experimental breeding of puffskeens besides the few fancy breeds, George explained. Granted, the market's too small to do much of that, Fred continued. Yeah, only a few dozen a year in Britain, a few hundred in Europe. The point is, they'll sell even better in weird colors. Now that explained a few things. So it is good, then, she said. All right, when the kits are old enough to breed, you'll want to outcross with other puff skeins as much as possible. And standard breeding practice is never to cross a dwarf with another dwarf. But even so, if you do it right, half the kits should be dwarfs. At least, that's how it was with dogs and cats. And she was pretty sure the genetics of the most common forms of human dwarfism were similar. But she really couldn't guess how it would be for magical creatures. Right, we get the picture, Hermione, George said indulgently. The important question is... Do you want to see them? Fred finished. Oh, very well. As long as they were back by curfew. They got up and were just about to leave when Harry stumbled into the common room. With a groan, he flopped onto the nearest sofa, rubbing his forehead above his right eye. Oh, rough night? Budge up. Ginny slid onto the end of the sofa so she could put his head in her lap. Harry groaned loudly. I think it's getting worse. What do you mean? I mean, before, my scar only prickled once in a while. It's been practically all the time this week. Really? Do you think you're making any progress? Hermione said worriedly. Harry shrugged as much as he could in that position. It doesn't feel like it. I've been dreaming about that damn corridor every night since we started. Well, that's not good. Professor Dumbledore wants you to stop having those visions. Have you at least been practicing? Uh, kind of. Harry, you have to put the work in. Hey, take it easy, Ginny stopped her. Harry's having a rough time of it. I do want you to get better at this, though, she told him softly. I don't like seeing you like this. I'm trying, Harry insisted. You give it a go, having Snape try to get inside your head. It's just like in potions. He doesn't explain anything. He just says, clear your mind and attacks. Get inside your head, Hermione thought. That was a different way of putting it, and that didn't sound like the kind of training she saw in the books. Huh, Ron said. I wonder, do you reckon maybe Snape's trying to make it worse? You know, make it easier for you-know-who to attack you? That's ridiculous, Hermione snapped. Snape's part of the Order. Dumbledore trusts him. But that was a knee-jerk reaction, if she were honest with herself. It did sound eerily plausible. Snape was a double agent and the evidence was Harry really was getting worse. It must be doing some good, she insisted. Maybe you're getting more sensitive to the attacks? I doubt it, Harry said. Snape never said anything about that, and it's always pretty obvious when he uses legitimacy on me to start with. What is legitimacy, anyway? It's mind-reading. Mind-reading? she said in surprise. Well, Snape insists it's not mind-reading, but it's basically mind-reading, he said with a weak smile. That was bad. That was way beyond what the books implied. Or maybe she just hadn't wanted to believe it. She had a bad feeling about this. How does it work? she asked. Well, he casts this spell, and then he's inside my head, going through my memories and stuff. It's supposed to require eye contact. Alarm bells were going off in Hermione's head one after another. But you don't have eye contact with Voldemort, 
What's going on with him? Apparently I'm getting visions and emotions and stuff from him some other way, and Dumbledore's worried he could use it to get to me, make me do things. Snape said something about him reading my mind back. Hermione turned ashen as the wall of denial she'd built came crashing down. Hermione? Ginny said. He what? She screamed so loud that the entire common room stopped and stared, but she was too livid to care. Hermione, what's wrong? Harry said. What's wrong? What's wrong? She stopped and looked around nervously, then unceremoniously hauled Harry up and started to drag him towards the stairs. Hey, I said lay off him, Ginny said, pulling her away from him. Ginny, do you have any idea what this means? Hermione hissed. Not unless you start acting sane and tell me. Not here, she said. We need to get somewhere private. Ginny gave an exasperated sigh and helped Harry up the stairs with her brother's following, which, in retrospect, was better than hexing her outright. When they finally reached Harry's and Ron's dorm, Ginny got in her face at once and said, Honestly, Hermione, where's the fire? Hello, Ginny. Voldemort can read Harry's mind. Okay, okay, we get it. That's bad. Yes, it's bad. Harry, how did you not think that was the most important thing about all this? Or important at all? Harry stared at the girl he considered his best friend in horror. He seldom saw her so angry, especially at him. What was happening to his life? Dumbledore was acting like he hated him, and now Hermione started hating on him too. Had everyone gone mental? Calm down, will you? he demanded. It's not like the world's ending. My biggest secret is the Order of the Phoenix, and that's under Fidelis' charm, so Voldemort can't learn that from me. This isn't about the Order of the Phoenix, Harry, she raved. I taught you my spells! Wait, what? Um, yes, you taught me your spells. Hermione looked at him like he was an idiot child. My spells, Harry. The spells I didn't want anyone else to know. Remember how you took down the dragon last year? Dilego Cathar Magnesia? Or how about the lightning curse from Saturday? We were the only two people who knew those spells, and I kept it that way for a reason. But if Voldemort reads your mind, he could learn them too. The burning laser charm, the eyelash curling hex. Those are the two spells you and Cedric used to escape him last time. He might know those too by now. And then there's all the stuff we've been doing this year. Oh, God, she felt faint. Oh, God, oh, no, 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 that, the D.A. The, the D.A.? That's how Umbridge found out about the D.A. What? Everybody said at once. Hermione, are you feeling all right? George said. What are you talking about? Fred asked. What does Umbridge have to do with Voldemort? Harry said. She's not a Death Eater. I thought she tried to disband all the clubs to push me off the Quidditch team. Damn it, Harry, will you think? Hermione yelled. We don't know for sure why she did it. It could have been about the D.A. even if she's not a Death Eater. Suppose Voldemort read your mind and found out about the D.A. and wanted to put a stop to it. It's to his advantage if we can't defend ourselves, isn't it? So he tells Lucius Malfoy. Malfoy finds some way to tip off Fudge without telling him how he knows, and Fudge tells Umbridge. What happens then? There was silence in the room, except for Ron's loud exclamation of, Bloody hell! Harry felt all eyes in the room painfully on him, even Ginny's, which showed a hint of fear in them. God, she was turning everyone against him. Hermione's gaze was still accusatory, which really made his blood boil. Well, it's not like I wanted to tell him anything, he shouted. I didn't even know before I started this mess. Dumbledore never told me. Dumbledore... She realized, and in a blink she made the connections, and her anger found a new outlet. Damn him, he never told anyone, the bastard! <clears throat> she ran from the room. She heard Harry yelling in confusion behind her, and was vaguely aware of several Weasleys sounding scandalized, but by the time she realized what was happening, she was already out in the corridors, nearly running to reach the headmaster's office. Fred and George had been sent there enough times to tell her that Dumbledore's passwords were always sweets. So when she skidded to a stop in front of the gargoyle, she started calling out, Sherbet lemon, cockroach clusters, Bertie bots, licorice wands, sugar quills, acid pops, fizzing whisbies, toffee eclairs, chocolate frogs, fudge flies, ice mice, jelly slugs. Why do we have such awful sweets? Tooth flossing, string mints, treacle fudge, Mars bars. 
Suddenly, the now annoyed looking gargoyle protecting the entrance to Dumbledore's office stepped aside and allowed her to pass up the stairs. Ma's paws, she said to herself. She'd been so worked up that she hadn't even realized she'd slipped into muggle candy. But her ire returned when she saw the headmaster's confused face, and she realized he'd probably been listening the whole time. Miss Granger, he said, whatever is so important that you would make such great efforts to overcome my security? Voldemort can read Harry's mind, she shouted. Dumbledore's eyes briefly widened in surprise, but then his countenance fell, and he sighed softly. Please have a seat, Miss Granger. Hermione wasn't in much of a mood to listen. Did it never occur to you that we might want to know, might need to know that information, Professor? She leaned across the back of the chair in front of her and tried to look intimidating. That we might have secrets that we confided him that we don't want Voldemort to find out? I assure you that I have been wrestling with that very question since the beginning of summer. I thought it best that this information was known to as few as possible until now. And look what you got from it! She laid into him. I've been blithely teaching Harry new spells I invented that I wanted to keep secret. For Merlin's sake, I taught him a spell to incapacitate a dragon in one shot. I didn't even show that one to Septima in detail, and now that and all the other spells I've taught him are potentially compromised. It was unconscionable, she thought. Here she was, running around and doing everything she thought she needed to do to keep her secret safe, and it still wasn't enough. She was going to wind up as paranoid as Moody at this rate. I trusted you, Professor. I trusted you that Harry would be safe with his aunt and uncle, even though he hates it there. And what happened? Bloody Dementors! And... And something else clicked for her. And you didn't tell me about the letters, either. You asked me not to write Harry with sensitive information because owls could be intercepted. But that wasn't it at all, was it? It was because Voldemort could learn it from Harry. But you apparently didn't trust me enough to tell me. And I went right on writing him through Dobby because you never saw fit to tell me why I shouldn't. This has been a security risk for months. Why didn't you do something about this sooner? The words poured out of her, unable to stop. She hadn't realized until just now how much of her faith in Albus Dumbledore had just been shattered. So far, Albus Dumbledore hadn't said anything in his defense. Not that he suspected his student had noticed. Now, Albus Dumbledore was, unequivocally, a genius. More to the point, he was the sort of man who could keep up two independent lines of thought at the same time. On one level, he was listening intently to Hermione's tirade, as a good teacher should, no matter how it was delivered. But on another level, he was reevaluating his plans and considering new possibilities. Once she seemed to get all of her complaints off of her chest, he calmly said, Are you finished, Miss Granger? That disarming question was enough for Hermione to collapse into horrified realization. She was screaming at her headmaster! She'd been screaming at Harry. Merlin, he must feel awful now. She'd blown up at him about all the things he was already having problems with this year. And then, she'd blown up at the most powerful wizard in the world. Maybe she really did have a temper that she needed to rein in. Oh my god, I'm so sorry, Professor, she gasped. I don't know what came over me. She sank into the chair absently and buried her face in her hands. I may be going intermittently hard of hearing in my old age, and did not hear any punishable offense, Dumbledore replied. Please take a deep breath, Miss Granger. I believe it would be beneficial for us to discuss this issue frankly, but I would urge you to try to calm yourself first. Sherbet Lemon? N no, thank you, she murmured, not meeting his eyes. I'm so sorry, Professor. All the stress with Voldemort and the Ministry in Umbridge, and having to be back here in Harry's detention in Umbridge... She snapped her mouth shut as she realized she was rambling again. It was so easy to forget, or make that willfully ignore, how much the stress could get to her. She hadn't even realized how much it was weighing on her until now. Dumbledore gave her a small smile. It is not a sin to express our emotions honestly. It is only when we refuse to listen to others equally that we err. She kept her gaze lowered to the desk. I was recently told that I have a strong vindictive streak, sir, she said. I should have I, I should have stopped and thought before I did something rash. 
"Recognizing our own faults is one of the most difficult things we can do, but also one of the most important," he said. There was a short pause, and she chanced to look up to see Dumbledore gazing with a far off, wistful look, but it vanished almost immediately. "I will admit that I have made mistakes with Harry, and I have made decisions that I still believe are correct that my closest confidence strongly disagree with. I did not consider how Perry's plight would affect his friends and their concerns, and for that I apologize. To answer your question, why didn't I act sooner? I knew of a strange link between Harry and Voldemort as early as his first year, though I did not fully understand it until recently. However, I did not fear for the safety of Harry's mind until Voldemort regained his full strength. Until then, Harry was the stronger of the two, and his secrets were safe. Hermione started to put the pieces together. And after that, you did act. You've been avoiding him. You were cold towards him. You wouldn't talk to him. You wouldn't look him in the... Oh no, she had a bad feeling about this. Why won't you look Harry in the eye, Professor? Another pause. He seemed to consider for a moment or two. Since you have come this far, I take it you know what legilimency is? He asked. She nodded. You may then have heard that legilimency nearly always requires eye contact. And the obvious corollary to that was... You believe Voldemort could read your mind through Harry. Dumbledore didn't answer that, but then he didn't really need to. Hermione felt her hands shaking. She felt an urge to scream at him again, but she forced it down. She counted to twenty, took a deep breath, and repeated her original question. Why didn't you do something about this sooner, Professor? Why not have Harry learn occlumency at the beginning of summer? And why Professor Snape? According to Harry, he's not teaching very well, maybe even making it worse. Worse? The headmaster raised an eyebrow at her. He says his scar hurts more than it did before he started. He always comes back from his lessons with a headache and looking like he has the flu. And what little I could find on occlumency in the library talks about it like meditation. And I don't think Professor Snape would be good at... You know that I've complained about his teaching before, sir. Vague directions with no help on methods or techniques. Dumbledore steepled his fingers and examined the girl's face closely. He could easily deduce the things she hadn't said. She was worried about the possibility of Voldemort reading her own mind through Harry. She had spells and other secrets that she wasn't ready even for him to know yet, and despite her young age, given her record so far, those spells could be truly valuable. She was understandably concerned about Severus's loyalty. She had been browsing the restricted section for occlumency and probably legilimency and other powerful magic as well. And she probably knew he knew all that. He nodded to himself. Yes, this might well be worth the risk. Miss Granger, he said solemnly, it might interest you to know that Remus informed me at once at the beginning of the school year when you told him you wished to help with our war effort. He did? Hermione said with wide eyes. She was too surprised to ask what that had to do with anything. He did indeed, and he recommended you quite highly. I had not thought much on it, because you are not yet of age, or even a fully qualified witch. But I think it is time I gave you a bit more consideration. Uh, um, th thank you, Professor? You're quite welcome. But I warn you, Miss Granger, if you involve yourself in the Order's business, you will have to learn how to keep secrets, much more than you are accustomed to keeping, especially from Harry. So you do think Voldemort would try to read my mind through him? She asked. That is a difficult question. You have already performed extraordinary feats of magic that must surely have attracted Voldemort's attention. Yet even given that, I suspect that in his arrogance he will not consider a sixteen-year-old muggle-born to be worth his time. On the other hand, Harry values you very highly, and Voldemort will likely know this, and given Harry's estimation of you, he may reevaluate you. That was roughly what she'd suspected, which was bad news. After all, she had spells she hadn't shared with anyone, and would prefer to keep that way. I understand keeping secrets, Professor, she said. What I don't understand is keeping Harry in the dark and unprepared. I... Honestly, your actions make no sense, and I'd like some answers. He gave her another small smile. I sympathize with your concerns. Unfortunately, the situation is more complex than you realize. When Harry had his recent vision revealing Voldemort's actions to him, I knew the matter could wait no longer. 
Voldemort has most likely become aware of the connection between the two of them, and he will likely begin to use it to try to influence Harry's actions. This must not happen. Therefore, Harry must learn occlumency. Then why didn't you? I did not start sooner, however, because I had and still have no suitable teacher for him, Dumbledore said, to her bewilderment. He explained. There are three people whom I trust implicitly and who have the skill to teach Harry occlumency. Severus Snape, Alistair Moody, and myself. As for Moody, his paranoia has caught the better of him. He steadfastly refuses to teach Harry so long as Professor Snape and I are still alive. I cannot teach Harry myself, because it would risk giving Voldemort access to my mind, which would be disastrous. That leaves only Professor Snape, but that carries another problem you may not have thought of. You mean, besides his dislike of Harry and his questionable teaching skills? she asked, wondering what else there could possibly be. As a matter of fact, I do. Professor Snape, as you know, is a double agent in Voldemort's organization, and Voldemort does not want him to teach Harry occlumency. But if he did it in secret, she started, but then caught herself. Except if Voldemort could read Harry's mind. Correct. If Voldemort sees Professor Snape teaching Harry occlumency, it will put Professor Snape's status as a double agent, not to mention his life, in jeopardy. But how can you ask him to teach him, then? Hermione exploded. How does that even work? The decision was a straightforward one, Miss Granger. I merely asked Professor Snape to continue his usual teaching style. His usual teaching style? She said. But his usual teaching style is... She stopped and closed her eyes and leaned forward until her forehead hit the desk with a thud. You ordered Professor Snape to teach Harry occlumency badly, she groaned. No wonder Harry wasn't learning. Snape actually wasn't trying. Leaning back again, she took a calming breath and continued. How do I put this tactfully, Professor? What sodding good does that do? She worried a bit that Dumbledore was growing impatient with her attitude, but he still answered her question calmly. It does do us good, Miss Granger, because even if Harry learns little occlumency, he will at least be put on guard. He will be aware that the visions Voldemort may send him, visions to induce him to act recklessly or expose himself, will likely be a trap. Then why don't you just tell him that, sir? She demanded. But how would I know? Um, wait, what? How would I know that Voldemort intends to trap Harry so that I may warn him to be wary of it? Of course, I could speculate, but knowing Harry as I do, I believe more than mere speculation will be needed to impress upon him the importance of such a warning. Likewise, I have deduced much on my own, but I do not wish to reveal the full extent of my information-gathering powers to Voldemort if I can help it. So... Where else would I have learnt of Voldemort's plans except from my spy in his ranks? Good lord, this was getting complicated. So, if Voldemort reads Harry's mind and finds out what you told him, she reasoned, he would question how you found out, and he would suspect Professor Snape of telling you more than he was supposed to. He nodded. Her anger flared again. So you send Harry to these these sham lessons that leave him emotionally traumatized just so you can deliver your warning in a sufficiently roundabout way? No, Miss Granger, Dumbledore said sternly. They are not a sham. The lessons may not be good ones, but I have legitimate reasons for ordering them. The chance that Harry really will learn some amount of occlumency, the fact that repeated experience with legilimency will make him more likely to recognize it and to hesitate before trusting what he sees... The fact that Sirius would not take no for an answer. I am aware that having him learn from Professor Snape will be stressful, but I remain convinced that Harry will be better off having these lessons than not. Hermione slumped in the chair. The line of logic seemed a little strained, or perhaps overcautious. But then again, she had no great love for Professor Snape and hadn't seen him do much that was useful so far, so she was probably biased. So where does that leave us? she said. The whole thing seemed pretty futile at this point. It leaves us at the point where I believe you could help. How much have you learnt about occlumency? 
I tried to look it up in the library. There wasn't much there, even in the restricted section. But I saw a lot of references to meditation and to controlling thoughts and emotions. But that's just the problem, Professor. Harry isn't a very meditative person. He wears his emotions on his sleeve, and, well, you know how he and Professor Snape are towards each other. Professor Snape is probably the worst possible person to teach it to him. And do you believe you could teach Harry better, Miss Granger? Hermione opened her mouth, but no sound came out. I do not mean that rhetorically, and no, I do not mean for you to attempt to use legitimacy to teach him. I mean, could you teach Harry the meditative techniques that would be useful to him, and would he be more receptive to you than Professor Snape? I... I... well... Uh, yes to both, sir. I... yes, definitely better than he's doing now. I could even order some muggle books on the subject. Some psychologists use meditation, and a lot of Eastern religions use it too, and... That is good, Dumbledore interrupted. That is the sort of thing I am looking for, but the task I am asking is subtler than that. If you were to learn occlumency yourself, do you believe you could steer Harry in the right direction, and, this is the most important part, without tipping him off to how much you know? You... you want me to learn occlumency, sir? She thought she might have misheard. I believe it would work to our advantage. It is an easy guess that you want to learn occlumency at this point. I... I do, but if Professor Snape... No, Miss Granger. Professor Snape must teach Harry because of his unique circumstances. You have no such problem. I am proposing that I will teach you occlumency. You... you, Professor? She gasped. Yes. It will be a more involved process, of course. I have a good deal more memories that I must needs hide away, and we must be careful that Professor Umbridge not become suspicious of our activities. But I suspect that you will be a faster learner than Harry, and I will be able to use better teaching methods than will Professor Snape. You will then be able to use your knowledge to teach Harry to better prepare him for his meetings with Professor Snape. But this option comes at a cost, he added before she could reply. Since I was insufficiently clear this past summer, I will be plain now. Harry must not know of our arrangement. He must believe that you are grasping at straws with a few library references and muggle meditation techniques, and that you are happening upon the correct ones by luck. You cannot tell him that you speak from authority when you teach him, even if he refuses your instruction. In the same way, Harry must believe that you are pushing him out of a desire to keep your own secrets, not to thwart Voldemort's plans, of which you ostensibly know nothing. Either truth could lead him to the truth of the arrangement I have made with Professor Snape, which cannot be allowed to happen. That was a sobering thought. Harry was hurting so much already, and she didn't want to make it worse. This sounded an awful lot like the things she was yelling at Dumbledore for a few minutes ago. I'm... I'm not so sure I can do that, sir. Keeping secrets is one thing, but manipulating him like that? It would feel like betraying Harry. He's been hurt so much by the lies already. You, of course, do not have to do anything you don't want to, he said. But you did ask to help the Order, and I am offering you an assignment, should you choose to accept it. Helping Harry learn occlumency will be more useful than any spell or artifact I could plausibly ask you to create, but your secrecy is imperative. Information is our most valuable weapon against Voldemort, and one wrong move could ruin all our work. I know, I understand where you're coming from, she said. She was the one who'd come in here raving about keeping her own secrets to begin with. Maybe it wasn't really about the secrets, though. Maybe it was about Dumbledore's attitude. I'm not sure I could hurt Harry like that after everything he's been through. He's still my best friend, and I don't want to alienate him any more than I have to. Dumbledore stroked his beard and regarded her carefully for a minute. She wondered if he was reading her mind. She doubted it. Harry said Snape was always blindingly obvious, but Dumbledore might be subtler. Miss Granger, do you know the story of Alan Turing? He said. Of course. He was a codebreaker during World War II. He basically invented the computer, he certainly derived the underlying logic of computers, 
and he did a lot of early work in artificial intelligence. A fair summary. It is his work as a codebreaker that I wish to discuss. I met Alan Turing more than once during the war. I found him a handsome young man, if I do say so myself, and brilliant beyond most other muggles I'd met, albeit very eccentric. I was most impressed by the way he broke the German Enigma code. Even in the magical world, our best arithmancers had studied the machine and concluded that it was impossible to crack efficiently enough to be of use. But Dr. Turing solved it. What you may or may not know, Miss Granger, is that on the night Dr. Turing broke Enigma, he became privy to the movements of the entire German naval fleet. And yet, as much as he wanted to, he could not act on that information, not even to save lives, for to do so would have alerted the Germans that their code was broken. Instead, he had to work carefully and methodically. He and his team had to compute mathematically how to achieve the greatest strategic gains with the least risk of detection and the least loss of life. It was a deadly game, cold and calculating. But it was also a game that could not be avoided, and it was a game that I believe you would excel at, but only if you had the convictions to follow it through. Hermione, if I may, he said softly. She was surprised to hear him use her given name for the first time. You have been blessed with an extraordinary talent, the likes of which even I have never seen before. Your work on Gamp's Law was something I did not expect to see in my lifetime. I wish I could shield you from the horrors of this war, if only until you and your friends came of age. But I fear that my ability to do so is slipping. I cannot foretell what will happen, but it may well be that some day soon you will be the Alan Turing of this war. Can you make the same choice he made? Hermione stared, wide eyes, as she felt the true weight of what he was asking of her fall on her shoulders. Could she make that choice? Could she play people like chess pieces with the nebulous promise that fewer of them would be hurt or killed in the long run? She knew she couldn't do it like Dumbledore did, standing aloof over everyone and acting without thought to their feelings. She wouldn't have the nerve for that, and she was a little surprised he did. But could she play the game? Perhaps. It would mean withdrawing from Harry, keeping all her secrets from him, and not looking him in the eye, like Dumbledore did. But if she thought about it, she'd have to do that anyway. At least this way, maybe she could fix it. From that perspective, there was no choice at all. All right, Professor, she said in a small voice. I'll do it. Dumbledore smiled. Thank you. I do believe you'll be a great help to Harry. Now, alas, it is growing late. It is already past curfew. I will write you a note to return to your dorm, though, according to Sirius and Remus, you have your own ways of going about the school without being caught by our illustrious High Inquisitor. I cannot professionally condone such actions, but it would be best if you avoid Professor Umbridge tonight, and when you come here in the future. She nodded. Now, considering your schedule, I think you should return after lunch on Saturday to begin your training. The correct password is Pepper Imps. He scrawled some lines with a quill. Because occlumency can only be passed directly from teacher to student, there are few books written on it. These will be the best references available to you in the library, and you are free to supplement them any way you wish from muggle literature. We will determine which techniques are most useful in our lessons. Thank you, Professor, she said. I'll do my best. You are quite welcome, Hermione. Good night. Hermione walked back to the dorm in a daze. She barely had the presence of mind to avoid the night patrols. She couldn't have imagined an hour ago that her night would end up like this. Hermione, George said when she climbed inside, and suddenly half of the now much emptier common room swarmed around her, all of them with red hair. Where's Harry? she asked. Went to bed and wouldn't come back down, Ron said. He looked really broken up. You want to explain what that was about? Ginny said testily. You yelled at Harry, accused him of accidentally giving away the DA, and then ran off. Hermione sighed wearily. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Ginny. I got hysterical. And I don't know for sure about the DA thing. I was just guessing on that. Maybe it really was about the Quidditch team. I didn't mean to hurt Harry at all. I just found out that some important and potentially dangerous information had been kept from me, and I... Went nuts, George suggested. I'll say, Fred agreed. 
I think she may have graduated to full Weasley with that rent. Good luck, George. He clapped his twin on the shoulder. Hermione normally would have a witty retort to that, but she wasn't in the mood. Well, as much as I just yelled at Professor Dumbledore, you might be right. You yelled at Dumbledore? Ron gasped. Bloody hell, we've created a monster. Oh, cool it, you. Look, I wanted to talk to Harry. What for? Ginny cut in. To apologize and to offer my help. Once I calmed down, Professor Dumbledore gave me some tips on how to help him with occlumency. But if he won't come back down, I'll just talk to him in the morning. Ginny reluctantly relented. Harry, I'm really sorry about yesterday, Hermione said, looking anywhere but her friend's face. I stand by what I said, but I wasn't very nice to you, and I should have been more considerate about how I said it. Oh, so you should have faked not being mad at me then? Harry replied in annoyance. I wasn't mad at you. Well, I was at first, but I wasn't after I realized that it was really Professor Dumbledore's fault for keeping it from both of us. I shouldn't have flipped out like that. Really? So why won't you look at me now? He said. She sighed. Because we haven't solved the problem. What do you mean? Look at me, Hermione. He laid a hand on her shoulder. Harry, stop! She jerked away and turned her back to him. What's your problem? Did Dumbledore get to you too? Is everyone going to start doing this now? Harry, please listen. She turned back towards him, but she still only stared at his chest. This is why I was so mad at Professor Dumbledore. He never told you why he didn't look you in the eye anymore. I figured he was mad about something, like how much I've got him in so much trouble this year. He doesn't care about that. I'm pretty sure he doesn't. Legilimency requires eye contact, remember? If Voldemort can get inside your head, it stands to reason he could try to read Professor Dumbledore's mind through your eyes. That's why he's been avoiding you. Harry didn't respond. The silence stretched long enough that she wasn't so sure he was sulking any more. She glanced up, and at the edge of her vision, she saw his mouth hanging open. I, I, I didn't know, he said. Exactly. It's not your fault, Harry, she said. Professor Dumbledore has secrets that he needs to make sure Voldemort can't find out. And frankly, I do too. I have more spells I haven't taught you, and I don't want to lose the element of surprise. Did Dumbledore tell you that? he demanded. Hermione started to say yes, but she stopped herself. Was this one of the secrets she needed to keep? It seemed like a stretch, but after last night, she was still feeling paranoid. I can't tell Harry anything that Voldemort would think Dumbledore learnt from Snape, she thought. What a mess. He was pretty vague on a lot of things, she said, truthfully. But it's not that hard to figure out. He told me enough about occlumency to guess it. She heard Harry grumbling. So, what, you're going to ignore me all the time like he does? No, I'm going to help you. What? I'm going to help you with occlumency. Huh? How? Join Snape's lessons? That gave her some pause. Dumbledore hadn't mentioned it, and it surely wouldn't be pleasant. But she couldn't write it off yet. It would give her plausible deniability for her skills. Maybe, she said. Any way I can, really. It can't really be taught except from teacher to student, but I can at least help you practice. Professor Dumbledore gave me a few references in the library, and I have some ideas about muggle meditation, too. Will that help? I have no idea, she lied, and she tried to ignore the turning in her stomach when she did. But it can't make things any worse, can it? I don't know. Snape is supposed to be helping me, too. Harry, it'll work. I'm sure of it. She shut her mouth at once, realizing even that might be saying a bit too much. Really? How? I... I meant... Hermione, can't you just tell me whatever it is? No, I'm sorry, but I can't tell you everything. I need you to trust me on this. Hermione still didn't meet his eyes, but she could feel Harry glaring at her. Yeah, I trusted Dumbledore already. It didn't go so well, he said. Hermione's voice choked. Merlin, it hurt to hear him talk to her like that. Harry, please, she managed. I'm not doing any of this to hurt you. I hope that after all we've been through, you'll trust me that I have your best interests at heart. I know trust is in short supply with you these days, but I can't be honest with you, 
and I can't be forthright with you as long as there's a chance Voldemort can find out what you know. I know you're hurting already, but as long as your mind isn't safe, I'm going to have to play Dumbledore's game. Keep secrets from you, even manipulate you, at least a little bit. I know you hate both of those things like I hate Dementors and Memory Charms. But I at least have the consideration to tell you what I'm doing and why, unlike Dumbledore, so I hope that will count for something. Harry was silent for a long time, and as Hermione kept an eye on the lower half of his face, she thought she saw his expression soften. "'It would have been nice if Dumbledore told me all this himself,' he said. "'I know. That's why I yelled at him last night.' "'I still hate the games he's playing, but I get why you don't want Voldemort learning your spells. "'I'm sorry I yelled at you, Hermione. I know you're still a good friend, and if you think you have a way to help me, I'll do it.' "'Oh, thank you, Harry,' she said with relief and hugged him. "'Yeah, but if I do manage to learn Occlumency, you're giving me the whole story, "'or I'll interrogate you with your own veritaserum.' "'She smirked, even though she knew he was completely serious. "'Deal!' 